Welcome to Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. Our team's goal is to present science-based information about gardening and all things nature in New York's Hudson Valley. Host Gene and Tim, along with team members Teresa, Linda, and Annie, are master gardener volunteers for New York's Columbia and Greene counties. So if you're interested in gardening or nature or nuggets of information about what's happening outside your door, settle in. Enjoy the conversation. Whatever the season, we have something to say. Hi, I'm Tim Kennelty. And I'm Jean Thomas. And welcome to Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. Today, we're going to learn about John Bartram and his connection with our local Hudson River and Greene County Catskills. With us is Kirk Brown, who's a nationally known speaker for such organizations as GardenCom, the Garden Writers Organization, and the American Nursery and Landscape Association. He also teaches landscape design basics at Northampton Community College in Pennsylvania. Kirk has a special connection with John Bartram, and we'll be channeling him today. We'll be trying to learn more about the Hudson Valley and New York colonies placed in the great age of scientific exploration prior to the Revolutionary War. So just a little refresher for those of you who've forgotten most of what we know. John Bartram was born in 1699 and died in 1777. He started out as a farmer in Pennsylvania, but his curiosity and need to explore made him become the premier plant hunter and nurseryman of the colonial era. He discovered and named hundreds of formerly unknown species, then developed a transatlantic trade in plants and seed to England and Europe, where landscaping was all the rage. John was self-educated and had a chip on his shoulder because of the way he was treated by those who held themselves superior to him. So you might notice some of his observations. Let's start our conversation with our guest from three centuries ago. Let's introduce John to our listeners. Welcome. You are famous as a botanist, conservationist, and plant hunter and explorer. I hear that Linnaeus himself called you the greatest natural botanist in the world. And is it true that you and Ben Franklin are pals? Pals is such a very common term that it doesn't begin to touch on the deep bounds of friendship that existed between Franklin and myself. We had spent many companionable hours deep in our shared cups of libation and pipe tobacco within the encircling comfort of upholstered winged chairs. That sounds wonderful. I understand that you also were known as the father of American botany. That's really amazing. Tell us a little bit about that. Now, wait. See, the father, <laughs> the fatherhood became me. With my first wife, I had two marvelous sons. And in that early spring of my life, both she and my second son, Richard, passed from me. And it was my second wife, Anne, who became my helpmate and lifelong friend. Together, she and I had nine additional children. That's friendship. <laughs> two of which were a pair of twins. The pair of twins was my third-born son with Anne, and William, as, as you will come to recognize him, in his generation became a much more renowned botanist and botanical illustrator. They actually, for many years, he disappeared from our home and family, and no one could locate him. So tell us about how you started to become a plant collector. Well, it allowed me to escape nine children on an annual <laughs> basis. <laughs> From a very early age, my father remarried after my mother died in birthing my younger brother. And he and his second wife moved to the Carolinas, had a small acreage. And in that move, I and my brother were housed by my grandmother. And so, as is the case with many extended families, my grandmother essentially gave me all of my world awareness. 
and it was in her garden and her knowledge of Native American medicinals, her medicine woman skills, if you will. That's where my horticultural botanical bug bit. John had a close affinity to the plants around him and was a keen observer of how they coexisted. He had an early appreciation of ecosystems and didn't think much of those who were bent on conquering the plant world. So, John, I ask everybody this question. Do you have a favorite plant among those that you've come across in your travels along the eastern coast? You know, if you go out into a field of native wildflowers... Sometimes you are just awash with our native daisy. And people say, well, what is your favorite plant? What, above all things, do you aspire to planting in your own personal gardens? I have to say from a very early age, my favorite plant was the oxide daisy. And you see them along highways and margins on the verges. And in my garden, they took pride of place because they were always a touch of my grandmother and how she taught me the skills that I would take with me throughout the remainder of my life. Right up until today, in fact, there is not a plant that I have had introduced to me that I haven't wanted to take home to my garden and try to kill. (laughs) Because it wasn't an oxide daisy? I'm sure the, the oxide daisy... You see them, and sometimes they're literally by the thousands out there in in a native field. And when you get to that point, when you see a field of native flowers, you understand the complexity of combined ecosystems is what they would call it today. In my world, in my day, it was it was the acknowledgement of a supreme being, of a deity, of that entity he, she, or it, who gave us our first perfect garden. As I understand it, you were very good at making your living by sharing the plants from our particular North American Eden into Europe and ended up making a living from it. Is that so? Yes. In the day of my explorations, in the travels, They were all based on those new areas of our geography, of our eastern seaboard, that I had yet to experience. And in those trips, get to see, note, and collect examples of botany that were then unknown to me. So everything came back to Philadelphia. And Bartram's explorations were across many unique natural systems over many years. We referred to Benjamin Franklin as a, a, a very good friend. He and I would review the successes of any given adventure. And he continued to urge me to, as he said it, hide not your talents, they for use were made. He asked a, a logical question, what's a sundial in the shade? And, and then he also said that I am in the prime of my senility. I think we all like to think of ourselves as being in the prime. And so I rest comfortably on my laurels. Okay, while you're resting, in your sobriety, didn't you and Ben together form a society for scientific discovery? Well, again, that was between Ben and I. I had tried to bring a strategic mass of scientific thinking to a multiple of subjects. And I thought in Philadelphia, being the largest city in the colonies, the largest port, everything passed through our port. I thought we in Philadelphia could begin a scientific society. What I needed in my thinking was to collectivize, to gather the names. And so with Ben's amazing help, we collectively founded the American Philosophical Society, which is still in existence and has a grand building just behind now what they call Independence Hall. It was the State House. And if you look at that building today, if you walk up to its major facade, in the center of the upper story is a niche, 
It is, a, it is an architectural element in prime masonry. And there is a statue carved in pristine white marble of a man in full Roman Augustan age virility. It is Benjamin Franklin. And on the cornerstone in that building, it says the American Philosophical Society was founded by Benjamin Franklin and others. Well, I guess John could be a little touchy from time to time. Let's steer him back to something more botanical. Can you tell us about the Bartram box made yes. famous by you? Well, I, I had a, a correspondent. I was introduced to a merchant, a fellow Quaker in London who traded in fine goods, fine fabrics, and his trade took his ships all over the world. And James Logan, who was the secretary and treasurer to our colony, gave me an introduction to the man. And he became, again, another very good friend, although we were never to meet in life. And he said, encouraged me, in fact, to send him personally samples of those botanicals that I'd found that he might be interested in. So that that began in the 17, late 1720s. And through that beginning, his trade in botanicals became bigger than even he could accede to. So he suggested quite openly that I start corresponding with others of the British then aristocracy who were developing fine country houses. And if you had Capability Brown doing your landscape in the great thousand acre nature of the outback in England, he encouraged you to begin a correspondence with me and to pay money to have delivered to you a Bartram's box. It kept the children busy and it taught them their math skills. Each box was guaranteed to have a thousand plants with as many as a hundred different diverse species. There were always labels on the lid that would give you the list of those plants that were included in each box. They came with no guarantee of life, but you paid five pounds, five shillings, which was considerable if, if you were not part of the aristocracy. And at our most successful, we sold 32 boxes a year. That's 32,000 plants shipped. My American history teacher may have mentioned that the 1700s were kind of a risky time to be shipping things. How did that go? The specter of a war with France, whether it was active or on the horizon or just resolved. There were French men of war who were shipping the seas, shopping for British merchantmen. And a lot of the boxes went awry. They ended up on French wharves instead of English. So it came to time where Peter Collinson and I, my, my merchant drapper, fellow Quaker and correspondent, decided that we would put labels on our boxes to French aristocracy so that if a French ongoing war vessel would capture a British merchantman, the boxes would end up in France, but go to a member of the aristocracy that would ship them across the English Channel to their other numbers on the other side. I worry about next day delivery when I order plants. How did things look when they arrived? Things were safe, but it took up to five years for some boxes. Imagine a box of plants, living green plants, surviving on a leaky wooden ship on salt water for five years. So no guarantees. Tell us some of the species that you shipped, some of the species that made it to England and that were planted there and survived. It was at the outset of the great English country house development. And so those plants that were most out of our northeastern hardwood bark forests were those that were most especially prized in England. Before the arrival of my 
boxes and before the advent of a capability brown design, England did not have fiery foliage in the fall. They had a few trees that turned certain colors, but with the advent of a Bartram's box, they began to get red maple, Acer rubrum, sugar maples, Acer saccharum, all of the family of oak trees, red oaks, their oak, an English oak goes from green to dead in the fall. <laughs> Whereas my oaks went from green to red, and it has forever been my opinion that is, it's far better to be red than dead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested in your adventures in our neck of the woods, John. I know you visited the famous Cadwallader Colden, who was not only a respected botanist, but a powerful political figure in New York Colony. You and he kept in touch over the years, and he was a very prestigious friend. I'm particularly interested, though, in his daughter Jane, who was a respected illustrator in her own right. What can you tell us about the Cadwallader's father and daughter? He had lots of children. We shared lots of children. Big summer parties on the lawn. That's why everyone came to Bartram's Garden. It was party central. It was like okay. going to Longwood with fireworks. Cadwallader, let's, let's, yeah. let's be serious for a yeah, moment. Let's. Okay. Cadwallader was born overseas. And he was invited to come to Philadelphia by his aunt Elizabeth Hill. So Cadwallader started his American experience in Philadelphia. I never moved in those high circles from that date. They were an established landed family. And Cadwallader had multiple degrees from university and brought that education to this country. He was also nigh on to the aristocracy but he briefly went back to Scotland, where he married in 1715, and, and then came back to this country that same year, to Philadelphia. So, of course, he was very much in and of the Quaker royalty of our colony for those initial years. And again, got to know many friends in common. Benjamin Franklin was an incredible friend, and later when we were planning the Philosophical Society, Cadwallader was certainly there at the planning stage and he became one of the charter members. So, yes. John was impressed with Jane Cadwallader's skill and talent and compared his son William to her, not in a flattering way. Cadwallader's daughter was a much more scientific artist. And once she started in a very much shortened life, she created some of this country's early and greatest botanical illustrations. She was on the, on the verge of publishing when she died. My son, not so much. While you and the Cadwalladers were exploring and documenting all the flood of your new discoveries, you also took sides with the Linnaean system of binomial nomenclature, right? As usual, John has a little bit of snark. I love it. The only way you could sell plants in the 18th century was to illustrate them. And you wanted to illustrate a mature version, a big plant or a mature specimen of leaf or seed. And because I agreed with Carl Linnaeus and Cadwallader's daughter was also a Linnaean botanist, we agreed this is the way to establish the order of plants and animals. There were 60 other ideas of how you could name plants and animals, but we all agreed that Carl, God bless him, and he thought he was the new Adam because he could touch and name <laughs> everything. Later, he just felt that he was the new God because he did touch and name everything. But the Linnaean system was something that you voted on. It wasn't a democracy. You either agreed with it or you didn't. And if you didn't, you had 60 others to pick from. The Cadwallader and Calden family were all Linnaeans, as was my family, as was William, as was Cadwallader's daughter. So was this about the time you became the botanist of the King of England? Britain lusted after the same 
agricultural and horticultural crops, but really didn't want to spend that kind of money. So they said, oh, let's let John do it. From what we were able to learn later, John was the botanist to the king for many years, but only ever got paid once. And it was poor form to ask for money, don't you know? John had a particularly difficult trip into what we now consider to be upstate New York in 1742, where he encountered his first serious snow and was mightily impressed. In 1742 and 1743, and I think I decided to go up to upstate, what you would know as upstate New York. Then it was the five Indian nations. And in that 1742 year, traveling to an Indian encampment that they called Oswego, I was caught out. It got very late. And yet I saw things in that year that I absolutely had to return the next year to collect, to get, to capture, to to understand from their medicine people the value and efficacy of the plants that I would be collecting. So I nearly died on that return trip, but they had given me housing in their encampment. They had a long house and they allowed me a room at the end that kept me whole and, and surviving through some of the worst snows that I encountered on any of my travels. You may be familiar with that in upstate New York. You go to bed one night and the next you come up out of two feet of snow that you slept under. John returned the next year, 1743, into a much more uneasy situation. That next year, 1743, there was a tremendous upheaval in the world. And the five Indian nations were being asked by the British to conspire against the colonies, the colonists, in in certain regards. So in that second year, in 1743, what occurred was that Conrad Weiser, now in our area, it's Weisenberg Township, they named a township after him. He was an Indian representative. He was a, a shipping interest of James Logan's out of Philadelphia, and he was involved with the trade across the Conestoga. And so he decided to go back to have a meeting, a substantial meeting with the five Indian nations. And he asked me and I was appointed to go along with him to have meetings, to discover our way forward through the morass of difficulties that we were facing in living together. I can't say that we were successful, but I did get back to the area where I most wanted to collect and most wanted to hear about what the botany of the area was. That was the trip where Franklin, don't you just love him? You know, people with ideas. Franklin said to me, if you would not be forgotten as soon as you are dead and rotten, either write things worth reading or do things worth writing. He thought my travel should be a book. And to that end, I very quickly put my thoughts together and offered them. And Peter Collinson read my letter at his society meetings and had it published. John, I got a look at the manuscript of your book. Very impressive work. I was particularly taken with the title. Without my approval and without any editorial comment, And it was called The Observations on Inhabitants, Climate, Soil, Rivers, Productions, Animals, and Other Matters Worthy of Notice, made by Mr. John Bartram in his travels from Pennsylvania to Onondaga, Oswego, and the Lake Ontario in Canada, to which is annexed a curious account of the cataracts at Niagara by Mr. Peter Kalm, a Swedish gentleman who traveled there and included a beef description of Niagara Falls by the naturalist Peter Kalm. John was starting to become elusive. He was probably getting tired. After the first 300 years, that happens, I guess. Tim had a question. Hey, John, so, can, I, can I ask you a question? Because you talked about the plants that you found that were so amazing in Oswego. Was one of them Menarda didima Oswego tea? 
Was that one of them? Eventually, I will I will send you a list of the 200 that became known wow, as my plants. Great. But because nomenclature was still in its infancy, and what I call them is not what you call them, I don't know that we're speaking of the same okay. plant. But you discovered 200 different plants? Is that what you're saying? We introduced 200 plants to the trade with England. The actual number of Bartram's introductions to the trade, as he says, will never be known. But here are some we can be sure of. Monarda, flowering dogwood, tulip poplars, laurel, maidenhair and rabbit's foot ferns. Many shrubs, viburnums, rhododendrons, calmia, and magnolias survived the voyage in the Bartram boxes. Fruits such as peaches, plums, grapes, gooseberries, and currants were added to Europe's pantries, and oddities like Venus flytraps and American ginseng were sent out. And the most famous of all, the Franklinia alatamaha, wrapped in mystery and legend. We'll never know the total contribution of the Bartram family. There was much chicanery, thievery, and Bartram's lack of formal education made him fair game for his superiors. Fortunately, he had friends in high places, and his son William eclipsed him with fame over the years. The family business continued well into the 1800s. After a short period of decline, the estate was rescued and expanded and stands today as a public park and arboretum. John died in 1777, aged 78 and still working on his farm. During and after the Revolutionary War, many of the founding fathers, including, of course, his dear friend Ben Franklin, visited from nearby Philadelphia and had great praise for his contributions to the young nation. Bartram's Garden is the oldest existing botanical garden in the country and worth a trip anytime. Thanks to Kirk Brown for channeling John Bartram today and challenging us. And thank you all for listening. That concludes another episode of Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. We would like to thank Sandra Powers and Devin Connolly from Cornell Cooperative Extension of Columbia and Greene Counties for production support. And a special thank you to our listeners for joining us on this episode of Nature Calls, Conversations from the Hudson Valley. You can find links to any of the topics mentioned in this episode at our website at ccecolumbiagreen.org. Comments and suggestions for future topics may be directed to us at Columbia Green MGB at Cornell.edu or on the CCE Master Gardener Volunteers of Columbia and Green County's Facebook page. For more information about Cornell Cooperative Extension of Columbia and Green Counties, visit our website at ccecolumbiagreen.org or visit us in Hudson or in Acre. Cornell Cooperative Extension provides equal programming and employment opportunities 